Michael Bever is charged with five counts of murder for the crime that happened inside their home in 2015. Michael Beaver stands accused of five counts of violence charges relating to a harrowing event that unfolded within their residence in 2015. They punched a knife into their sister's neck. They then went and attacked their mom. Notorious for his violent nature, Craig Price takes center stage in this narrative. Brace yourself for an exploration into the dark recesses of crime, where age proves to be no deterrent. Get me out of state. That's what I want to do. Prepare to be astounded as we unveil a lineup showcasing the youngest serial killers in recorded history. It was no surprise to me that Mary began killing. The only surprise is that she did it so soon. In this chilling annals, we come face to face with the unsettling truth that evil can emerge from the most unexpected sources and manifest in the most unsuspecting of forms. Join us as we embark on a journey through the top 10 youngest serial killers, a tale that will undoubtedly send shivers down your spine. Number 10. Amarjeet Sada Amarjeet Sada, the world's youngest serial killer. Born in 1998 in Bihar, India, Amarjeet's childhood took a chilling turn when he committed his first crime at the tender age of eight. Raised in a poor family in the village of Musahahar, he led a solitary life, finding solace in the quiet corners of his surroundings. His descent into darkness began in 2006 when his aunt and her young daughter came to stay. Left alone to care for the children, something strange stirred within Amarjeet. What started as mere slaps and pinches soon escalated into something far more sinister. In a shocking turn of events, he ended the life of his six-year-old cousin, leaving the entire community stunned and horrified. But this was just the beginning. Despite confessing his crime to his parents, he faced no consequences for his actions. Emboldened by their silence, he struck again, this time targeting his sister. In a cold and calculated act, he snatched her from her cot one winter afternoon and ended her innocent life. When questioned by his mother, his response was chillingly indifferent, just like that. However, it was his third murder that finally brought him to the attention of the authorities. In 2007, he claimed the life of a baby girl named Kushbu. After luring her away from her mother, he brutally ended her life with a stone and buried her behind a primary school. Remarkably composed during questioning, Amarjeet showed no remorse for his actions, displaying a disturbing calmness that belied his young age. Sentenced to a juvenile home, and doctors diagnosed him with a conduct disorder, revealing his disturbing pleasure in causing harm to others. As he turned 18 in 2016, he was released under a new identity, disappearing into the shadows without a trace. Today, his whereabouts remain unknown, leaving behind a haunting reminder of the darkness that can reside within even the youngest among us. Amarjeet Sada's story serves as a sobering reminder of the depths of human depravity. It highlights the urgent need for early intervention and support for children at risk of falling through the cracks. While his actions may shock and disturb us, they also compel us to confront the systemic issues that contribute to such unimaginable acts of violence. As we grapple with the aftermath of his crimes, we must strive to create a world where every child feels safe, loved, and valued. Only then can we hope to prevent tragedies like those perpetrated by young Amarjeet Sada from ever occurring again. Number 9. Harvey Miguel Robinson Meet Harvey Miguel Robinson, a name that sends shivers down the spines of Allentown, Pennsylvania residents. He's not your average teenager. He's the youngest serial killer in American history, etching his name into the darkest corners of our nation's past. Robinson's descent into darkness began early, at just nine years old, when he was caught stealing from a store. But petty theft was merely the tip of the iceberg. As he grew older, his brushes with the law became more serious, culminating in charges of violence. Raised in a tumultuous environment, he had a troubled role model in his father, Harvey Miguel Robinson Sr., a man known for his abusive tendencies and struggles with alcohol. The elder Robinson's violent streak reached its zenith when he brutally took the life of his mistress in a fit of rage, leaving behind a scene of unimaginable horror. But the apple didn't fall far from the tree, 
Robinson Jr. embarked on a reign of terror that would leave Allentown reeling. Over just a few short years, he committed a series of heinous crimes, including the brutal violation and massacre of three women. DNA evidence left no doubt as to his guilt, sealing his fate in the annals of criminal history. His first victim, Joan Burghardt, met a grisly end in her own home, her life extinguished by Robinson's callous brutality. Then came Charlotte Schmoyer, a 15-year-old newspaper carrier whose promising future was snuffed out by his savagery. But Robinson's depravity knew no bounds. He didn't just target women. He preyed on the innocent, even attempting to take the life of a five-year-old girl in cold blood. His actions were those of a remorseless predator, driven by a darkness that defied comprehension. Despite the overwhelming evidence against him, Robinson's journey through the justice system has been anything but swift. Endless appeals and legal maneuvers have kept him off death row, prolonging the suffering of his victims' families and draining taxpayer resources. And the cost? It's staggering. Taxpayers have footed the bill for his legal battles to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars, making his case one of the most expensive in Pennsylvania's history. Yet, despite the mounting costs and the slim chance of ever seeing justice served, some still argue for the ultimate punishment. For them, Robinson's crimes are proof that some monsters must face the consequences, no matter the price. But as he languishes behind bars, his case serves as a sobering reminder of the complexities and moral quandaries surrounding the death penalty. In a system plagued by delays and exorbitant costs, the quest for justice can often feel like a futile pursuit. In the end, Harvey Miguel Robinson remains a haunting figure in the annals of American crime, a chilling reminder of the darkness that lurks within us all. Number 8. James Fairweather Ever met a teenager so enthralled by notorious killers that he decides to walk in their footsteps? That's exactly what happened with James Fairweather, just a teenager at the time, who callously ended the lives of two innocent strangers. At a mere 15 years old, Fairweather committed an unfathomable act of violence, stabbing James Atfield an astounding 102 times in a park in Colchester, Essex, back in March 2014. Then, just three months later, he struck again, mercilessly taking the life of a Saudi student, Nahid Almanea, 31, while she was simply out for a stroll along a nature trail. Despite eventually admitting massacre, Fairweather attempted to evade the gravity of murder charges, claiming he was possessed by the devil and driven by relentless voices in his head. But his feeble excuses didn't hold up in court, as the jury saw through his facade and convicted him of violation. His fixation with infamous serial killers like Ian Huntley, Myra Hindley, and the notorious Yorkshire Ripper Peter Sutcliffe was nothing short of chilling. He even kept a picture of Sutcliffe on his phone. And his favorite? None other than the infamous American Ted Bundy, renowned for his gruesome crimes. But Fairweather's fascination didn't stop at idolization. He yearned to replicate their atrocities. He even indulged in fantasies of taking the lives of his head teacher and parents. His dark reveries were fueled by violent video games and grisly horror films, including graphic content like Wrong Turn The Carnage Collection and literature detailing the world's worst crimes. The aftermath of his crimes was equally disturbing. He obsessively tracked media coverage online and spent his days consumed by thoughts of violence. Despite his claims of psychosis, experts argued that Fairweather knew exactly what he was doing. He meticulously planned his attacks, even going as far as disposing of the executed weapon to cover his tracks. When the jury finally delivered their verdict after hours of deliberation, Fairweather showed no emotion. He now faces a lengthy prison sentence, but for the families of James Atfield and Nahid Almanea, Justice brings little solace. They've endured unimaginable pain and grief, forced to relive their loved one's tragic deaths through a trial. Fairweather's actions have left indelible scars on their lives. Julie Finch, Atfield's mother, expressed the family's anguish, emphasizing that her son didn't deserve such a cruel fate. Similarly, Almanea's family mourned the loss of a remarkable and gentle soul, leaving behind a legacy of kindness and academic excellence. The community remembers Nahid Almanea fondly, honoring her memory through scholarships and tributes, but nothing can erase the senseless tragedy caused by his actions. 
As the trial concludes and Fairweather faces the consequences of his horrific acts, the community grapples with the aftermath of such senseless violence. And though justice is served, the wounds left behind will take much longer to heal. Number 7. Michael Hernandez A tragic tale unfolds as we look into the unsettling story of Michael Hernandez, a young man whose fascination with serial killers took a deadly turn. In 2004, at just 14 years old, Hernandez harbored a chilling obsession with infamous criminals, spending hours scouring the internet for details of their heinous acts. His dark curiosity soon morphed into a sinister desire to emulate these evildoers. On a fateful day in February, Hernandez, armed with a knife and a chilling determination, set foot in his school, Southwold Middle School in Palmetto Bay, Florida. His intention? To embark on a path of terror, mirroring the atrocities of the world's most notorious serial killers. However, his plans took a horrifying turn when his intended victim declined his invitation to enter the boy's bathroom, sensing something awry. Undeterred, Hernandez sought out another classmate, Jamie Gauff, whom he lured into the restroom under the guise of showing him something. Tragically, Gauff, unsuspecting of his friend's malevolent intentions, followed Hernandez into the stall. What followed was a brutal and senseless attack, as Hernandez mercilessly attacked Gauff with the knife. Despite the horrific nature of his crime, Hernandez brazenly returned to class concealing his bloodied hands. It wasn't long before the discovery of Goff's lifeless body sent shockwaves through the school, prompting authorities to apprehend him. Subsequent investigations unearthed chilling evidence of Hernandez's disturbed psyche, including journals detailing his murderous fantasies and plans. His sister even found herself listed as a potential victim, alongside others, with methods of murder meticulously outlined. Hernandez's attempt to plead insanity fell on deaf ears, and he was sentenced to life in prison in 2008. Yet, his story took a tragic turn when he succumbed to a natural death in 2021, his young life extinguished by cardiac dysrhythmia attributed to morbid obesity at the age of 31. The story of Michael Hernandez serves as a stark reminder of the dangers lurking within the shadows of seemingly ordinary lives. It's a chilling testament to the harrowing consequences of unchecked obsession and the devastating impact it can have on innocent lives. His journey from a curious teenager to a convicted murderer serves as a cautionary tale, urging us to confront the darkness that resides within and strive for a world where such tragedies are but distant memories. Number 6. Craig Chandler Price the name sends shivers down the spines of those who know him, conjuring images of terror and tragedy. Born on October 11, 1973, in the quiet town of Warwick, Rhode Island, Price's life took a dark turn early on. By the tender age of 13, he had already embarked on a path of destruction that would forever stain the pages of history. With a criminal record tainted by petty theft, Price's descent into darkness began innocuously enough. But it wasn't long before innocence gave way to malevolence. In the summer of 1987, on a fateful night in July, he committed his first crime. Breaking into a nearby home, he brutally took the life of a 27-year-old Rebecca Spencer, leaving behind a scene of unimaginable horror. However, this was just the beginning. Two years later, in 1989, Price, now 15 years old, unleashed a reign of terror that would rock Warwick to its core. Fueled by a cocktail of narcotics, he embarked on a nightmarish rampage, claiming the lives of three more innocent victims. Joan Heaton and her two young daughters became the unfortunate targets of Price's unfathomable fury, their bodies bearing the gruesome marks of his violence. But Price's atrocities didn't end with the bloodshed. Despite his arrest and subsequent confession, his demeanor remained chillingly calm. Behind bars, he continued to defy authority, accumulating a litany of charges that spoke to his unrestrained aggression. From refusing psychological evaluations to assaulting corrections officers, Price's behavior only served to cement his status as a menace to society. As the community grappled with the aftermath of his crimes, efforts to ensure Price remained behind bars gained momentum. Rhode Island residents, appalled by the brutality of his deeds, united under the banner of citizens opposed to the release of Craig Price. 
Their advocacy led to legislative changes to prevent similar tragedies in the future. Yet, despite their tireless efforts, his grip on the public consciousness remained unyielding. Transferred to Florida due to concerns over his violent tendencies, Price's reign of terror persisted. In 2009, he found himself embroiled in yet another violent altercation, this time with a fellow inmate. Armed with a makeshift weapon, he lashed out, leaving a correctional officer injured in the chaos. Despite attempts to contain his aggression, Price proved himself a formidable adversary, his propensity for violence undiminished. In 2017, Price's insatiable thirst for blood reared its head once more. Accused of violating a fellow inmate with a homemade knife, he faced yet another reckoning. In January 2019, justice finally caught up with him as he was sentenced to 25 years for his heinous act. Craig Chandler Price The name lingers in the collective consciousness as a stark reminder of the darkness that lurks within us all. His story serves as a chilling cautionary tale, underscoring the fragility of innocence and the enduring presence of evil in our midst. Locked away from society, he stands as a chilling testament to the horrors that can unfold when innocence is twisted into malice. Now let's check out today's subscriber pick. One of the most heinous acts of violence was perpetrated by David Brom in February 1988. The teenager left the entire city of Rochester, Minnesota horrified by what he did to his own family. In the early evening of February 18, Olmsted County Sheriff's deputies discovered the bodies of Bernard, Paulette, Diane, and Richard Brom in the Brom family home. David and Joe, the two oldest boys, were missing from the residence. The administration of David's school had reported to the police that pupils had heard a rumor that David had told another student that he had killed his family that morning. All four people had incurred many gashes to the head and upper torso. Police later discovered a blood-stained axe in the basement, which forensic testing revealed was used to kill all four victims. Immediately after the finding, the police were concerned that David had been kidnapped, but a friend of David's alerted the police that David had told her that he had attacked his family and he testified to the discussion during the ensuing trial. According to her, he said he hit his dad with an axe, he kept hitting his dad and his dad kept on getting up. According to the girl, Brahm informed her that he had an altercation with his father around 11.30 p.m. the night before and stayed up until approximately 3 a.m. She stated that Brahm described the incident, claiming that he went to his parents' room and first ended his father's life. Then he struck his mother and walked into his brother's room. Then he noticed his sister standing over their mother in the upstairs hallway, and he attacked both of them. Brahm was apprehended on 19th February while using a payphone outside the local post office. His case was first sent to the juvenile court system since he was 16 at the time of the offenses, but it was subsequently transferred to the adult legal system due to the gravity of the offense. Because Brahm's defense claim was insanity, Mental illness played a role in the trial, and significant media and legal attention were focused on Minnesota's use of the Monoton rules to determine whether Brom was legally crazy at the time of the crime. Brom was convicted of first degree on October 16, 1989, and sentenced to three consecutive life terms, with 52 years and six months before parole. Number 5. Jasmine Richardson A Child Turned Monster Jasmine Richardson was only 12 when she, along with her 23-year-old boyfriend, Jeremy Steinke, committed a horrifying crime. They didn't just take the lives of her parents, Mark and Deborah, but also her 8-year-old brother, Tyler Jacob. The nightmare began on April 23, 2006. A 6-year-old boy stumbled upon the lifeless bodies of Mark and Deborah through a window of their home. Upstairs, Little Tyler's body was left to decay in the bed. Initially feared abducted, Jasmine was nowhere to be found, but the evidence pointed to her involvement, dashing any hope of her innocence. Just a day later, a hundred miles away, Jasmine and Jeremy were apprehended. Both faced three counts of first-degree charges. How could such a young child conceive such a horrific act? Jeremy, who fancied himself a 300-year-old werewolf, met Jasmine at a punk rock concert. She fell hard for him and his goth lifestyle. Despite objections from her family, 
their love persisted. Forbidden from seeing Jeremy, Jasmine felt trapped. Their solution? Terrible violence. Despite Jasmine's idle threats, no one took her seriously until it was too late. Online accounts revealed their chilling plan. Her message to Jeremy, I have this plan. It begins with me taking the life of them and ends with me living with you. Jeremy's post on Windows Live Spaces exposed their motive, revenge. Their blood shall be payment, he wrote. Their plan unfolded mercilessly. Jeremy attacked Jasmine's parents downstairs. Then upstairs, Jasmine harmed her pleading brother. They left him in distress. Why? I loved him so much. I thought it would bring us closer together, she testified. In June 2007, Jasmine faced trial at just 14. The verdict? Guilty on all counts. Her sentence? 10 years. The maximum for juveniles under 14. Four years in psychiatric care, followed by community supervision. Jeremy received life. Despite a troubled past, no leniency was shown. Released at 2011, she entered university. Her attorney believed she wouldn't re-offend. At her final court appearance, Jasmine expressed no remorse. A chilling end to a tragic tale. Number 4. Mary Bell In the annals of criminal history, few names evoke as much dread and fascination as Mary Bell. Born into a world of turmoil and neglect in 1957, her early years were marred by the absence of parental care and marked by a series of unfortunate events. Raised by a troubled mother who viewed her as a burden, Mary's childhood was a tumultuous journey through neglect and abuse. But behind the facade of a troubled child lay a darkness that would eventually consume her. At the tender age of 10, she embarked on a chilling path that would forever alter the lives of families and cast a shadow of fear over her community. In 1968, she committed her first heinous act, strangling four-year-old Martin Brown and leaving haunting confession notes for his family. Two months later, she claimed another victim, three-year-old Brian Howe, in a brutal and senseless act of violence. The community was gripped by fear as the innocence of childhood was shattered by Mary's unfathomable acts. Despite attempts to conceal her guilt, her actions betrayed the chilling truth that lurked beneath her facade of innocence. The authorities were confounded by the magnitude of her crimes, struggling to comprehend the depths of her depravity. The trial that ensued offered a glimpse into the mind of a child assassin, painting a portrait of Mary Bell as a remorseless predator driven by an insatiable thirst. Though convicted, her sentence was marred by controversy, as psychiatrists attributed her actions to psychopathy, sparking debate over her culpability. Yet, even behind bars, Mary's legacy endured, her name synonymous with evil incarnate. Her release in 1980 marked the beginning of a new chapter, one shrouded in secrecy and anonymity. Protected by the law, Mary sought refuge from the prying eyes of the relentless media, determined to reclaim her life amidst the chaos that engulfed her. But the past has a way of resurfacing, casting a long shadow over Mary's attempts at redemption. Her daughter, oblivious to her mother's dark past, became a pawn in the media frenzy that ensued, thrusting Mary back into the spotlight she so desperately sought to escape. Today, Mary Bell remains a prisoner of her own making, confined to a life of seclusion and anonymity. Yet, amidst the whispers of condemnation and outrage, some question the validity of her protection, demanding justice for the lives she shattered. In the annals of criminal history, Mary Bell's name remains etched in infamy, a reminder of the fragility of innocence and the darkness that lurks within us all. As the world grapples with the aftermath of her atrocities, one question lingers in the minds of many. Can a monster ever truly be redeemed? Number 3. Ed Kemper Ed Kemper, better known as the co-ed killer, a notorious figure in American criminal history. From 1964 to 1973, he ended the lives of eight individuals, predominantly non-familial female college students, hitchhiking in Santa Cruz County, California. But that's not where the horror ends. Kemper's crimes went beyond mere massacres. In 1973, he faced the justice system, which handed him eight concurrent life sentences. Strangely enough, he requested the death penalty, a request that couldn't be fulfilled due to California's laws at the time. Fast forward to today, 
and Kemper, now 74 years old, resides in the California Medical Facility in Vacaville, a place that once housed other infamous names like Charles Manson and Herbert Mullen. His story was brought to the small screen in 2017 through Netflix's Mindhunter, where actor Cameron Britton portrayed him. Britton's portrayal earned him a Primetime Emmy Award nomination for Outstanding Guest Actor in a Drama Series. Mindhunter delves into the intricate minds of criminals, following FBI agents Holden Ford and Bill Tench as they seek to understand and capture serial killers by studying their twisted psyches. With acclaimed director David Fincher and Oscar-winning actress Charlize Theron on board as executive producers, the show garnered attention for its gripping narrative. Dr. Anne Wilbert Burgess, a researcher, had the opportunity to converse with Kemper in person during her time in prison research. Despite his heinous crimes, she described him as an engaging conversationalist, highlighting his articulate nature and commanding voice. Standing at an imposing height of 6 feet 9 inches and boasting an IQ of 136, his physical stature and intelligence add another layer to his chilling persona. Ed Kemper's story sends shivers down the spine. From his gruesome crimes to his surprising intellect, he remains a haunting figure in the annals of criminal history. Number 2. Alyssa Bustamante When most teenagers get a break from school on a Friday, they usually take it easy. Maybe catch up on sleep, hang out with friends, or just lounge around at home. But for Alyssa Bustamante, a 15-year-old from Missouri, Fridays meant something entirely different. Instead of chilling out, she had a plan in mind. While her peers were thinking about weekend fun, Alyssa was busy digging. Yeah, you heard it right, digging graves. Not one, but two. Now that's not your typical Friday activity, is it? Fast forward four days and things took a dark turn. Elizabeth Olton, a nine-year-old neighbor, went missing. She was last seen walking home from a friend's house. But little did anyone know, Alyssa was lying in wait, ready to pounce on her unsuspecting victim. Elizabeth's disappearance sent shockwaves through the community. Her family, frantic with worry, searched high and low for her. But Alyssa? She carried on with life as if nothing had happened. Because to her, everything had gone according to plan. Alyssa's plan wasn't just sinister, it was downright diabolical. When she spotted Elizabeth walking home, she saw her chance and seized it. She horrifically attacked her. Then she callously dumped Elizabeth's lifeless body into one of the graves she had dug just days before. As the search for Elizabeth intensified, she remained cool as a cucumber. She had covered her tracks well, or so she thought. But one letter changed everything. Alyssa's confession sent shockwaves through the community, leading authorities straight to Elizabeth's grave. But why would a 15-year-old girl commit such a heinous act? Her explanation was chillingly simple. She wanted to know what it felt like to kill someone. But let's be real here. Normal, mentally stable people don't entertain such thoughts, let alone act on them. Alyssa wasn't your average teenager. She had a troubled past, battling with depression, attempting to take her life multiple times and engaging in self-harm. Red flags? Yeah, they were there. But nobody saw the darkness lurking beneath her seemingly normal facade. Charged with first-degree violation, Alyssa faced the consequences of her actions. Tried as an adult, she stood before the court, her plea of not guilty ringing hollow in the face of overwhelming evidence. She couldn't escape the truth. She had taken a young girl's life in cold blood. Her defense team tried to deflect blame, pointing fingers at Prozac and her troubled family history. But deep down, everyone knew the truth. Her darkness ran far deeper than any pill could reach. In the end, faced with the undeniable truth, Alyssa pleaded guilty. She confessed to the horror she had unleashed upon Elizabeth Olton, and as the courtroom gasped in disbelief, Alyssa's fate was sealed. She would spend her days behind bars, a stark reminder of the chilling reality that lurks beneath teenage smiles. Number 1. John Venables and Robert Thompson In 1993, John Venables and Robert Thompson were convicted of involvement in the tragic case of James Bulger's abduction and death. Following their guilty verdict, they were detained indefinitely. However, 2000, after undergoing rehabilitation and a review process, were released back into society with new identities. While Thompson managed to establish a stable life, 
he faced numerous challenges, including legal troubles and struggles with addiction. Despite attempts to remain anonymous, Venables was repeatedly caught engaging in concerning behavior, including possessing inappropriate material and assuming false identities online. These actions led to his return to prison in 2017. Currently, he remains incarcerated, having been denied parole. However, the debate over whether to maintain his anonymity continues. James Bulger's father advocates for lifting Venables' anonymity, while his mother expresses concerns about potential violence against him. Courts have tended to err on the side of secrecy, citing safety concerns. Recently, there has been discussion about the possibility of him being considered for parole again. Denise Fergus, James's mother, faces another period of uncertainty as she awaits the outcome of these deliberations. The story of Venables and Thompson illustrates the complexities surrounding second chances. While Thompson managed to rebuild his life and integrate into society, he struggled to leave his past behind. Despite efforts at rehabilitation, he found himself ensnared in a cycle of recidivism. Now, as the world watches, the question remains, will Venables ever fully atone for his actions? The case prompts reflection on broader societal issues, including the rehabilitation of offenders and the balance between punishment and redemption. It also raises questions about the effectiveness of measures such as anonymity in protecting both victims and perpetrators. As the legal system grapples with these questions, the fate of Venables serves as a sobering reminder of the complexities inherent in seeking justice. Ultimately, the story of Venables and Thompson serves as a cautionary tale, highlighting the challenges and limitations of the criminal justice system. It underscores the need for ongoing dialogue and reflection on how best to address the complexities of crime and punishment in society. As Venable's case continues to unfold, it remains to be seen what lessons will be learned and what steps will be taken to prevent similar tragedies in the future. We hope you enjoyed this video. We'll see you in the next one.